Armstrong, and this is VOA One, the hits. Hey. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower. And we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel and Anna Mateo. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will continue our series on America's national parks. But first, Chloe Chow's Academy Award wins for Best Director and Best Picture are being met with restrained reaction in China, her country of birth. Chow's Nomadland is the second film directed by a woman to win an Academy Award or Oscar for Best Picture. She is the first woman of color. And second woman ever to win the Oscar for Best Director. Yet in China, her history-making success has not been broadcast or celebrated. State media in China remained silent as of Monday afternoon, with no statement of her win by either CCTV or the Xinhua News Agency. A post announcing Chow's directing win by film magazine Watch Movies appeared on the Chinese media service Weibo, but it was censored a few hours after it appeared Monday morning. The hashtag Chloe Chow wins Best Director was also censored on the service. Users who searched under the hashtag received an error message saying, "Page is not found." Some Weibo users began using ZT to post about Chow. Those are the first letters of her full name in Chinese, Chou Ting. Putting in Chow's name in Chinese. Brought up only unrelated posts from the beginning of April. A search for Oscars showed only official posts from the South Korean and U.S. embassies. A news story on WeChat, the largest messaging service in China, was also removed. But news of Chow's wins did spread onto the Chinese internet. With individual web users praising the filmmaker, many took note of her acceptance speech, which included a line from a poem written in the 13th century Chow had memorized as a child. The line in English means, "People are good at birth." South Korean actress Yoon Yeo Jung, who played the grandmother in the film Minari. Could be found in searches on the Chinese internet. Yoon won the Best Supporting Actress award, becoming the first Korean performer to win an Oscar. Actor Yoon Yeo Jung was at the top of Twitter's trending list. Other South Korean performers quickly offered their congratulations. Actor Lee Byung Hun posted a photo of Yoon holding an Oscar trophy. Impossible is just an opinion," he wrote on the post. Actors Bae Duna and Kim Hae Soo also congratulated Yoon on social media. Chow faced criticism in China in March after winning a Golden Globe Award for Best Director. Internet users questioned whether she could be called Chinese. Some said she had insulted her birth country in comments on the political system. China's media organizations are closely controlled by the ruling Communist Party. Online criticism can often result in calls for boycotts of famous people or big companies. Be 
before the criticism in March, local media reported Nomadland was set for release in China on April 23rd. But the film did not open last week, and there was no official word on a release date. Employees at two movie theaters in Beijing said they did not know of any future showings of the film. Frances McDormand won the Best Actress Oscar for her performance in Nomadland. Anthony Hopkins won Best Actor for his performance in The Father. And Daniel Kaluuya won the Best Supporting Actor Oscar for his role in Judas and the Black Messiah. The U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments Wednesday in a closely watched case involving a teenager's freedom of speech on social media. In 2017, when Brandy Levy was 14, she wanted to be a cheerleader at her school in Pennsylvania. She competed for a place on the team, but she was not chosen for the best team. Instead, she was told she would be on the second best team. She was upset, and while she was at a store close to her school, she took a picture of herself making a sign with her finger that is offensive in the United States. She then posted the photo on the social media service Snapchat, and also added text with a bad word. Levy was mad that she was not chosen for the top team and expressed her anger with the post. While the post could only be seen for one day, adults who ran the school saw it. So did a number of students. The school punished Levy by banning her from the team for one year. It said Levy's Snapchat message upset other students and disrupted classes. The adults who ran the cheerleading team said Levy broke team rules and hurt the cohesion of the team. Levy and her parents wanted her to be put back on the cheerleading team. They took their case against the school to court. They got legal support from the American Civil Liberties Union, a civil rights group. A lower court judge ordered the school to let her back onto the team. The school appealed that decision to the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in Philadelphia. But the U.S. Appeals Court said the school could not punish Levy because she was off campus. The school, however, appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The school said it was permitted to punish Levy because of an almost 50-year-old decision. In 1969, The Supreme Court said students could be punished for disruptive speech. After the case is presented in Washington, D.C., the court should make its ruling by June. Levy is now 18 and in college. Thinking back on how she felt four years ago, she said the punishment felt wrong. She said she thought her action was small and she was only expressing her feelings. She said recently that she did not bully or harass anyone in her message. The court ruling will set an important example for speech. 
Schools say if the court rules for Levy, it will make their job more difficult. School leaders say it is already hard to keep students from making disruptive statements on social media. These incidents, they argue, most often happen outside of school hours and while students are at home, but they affect the student body. In a paper the school submitted for the case, it asked, Where school property ends in the world of internet messaging? If a student sends harassing emails to school accounts from home, where did the speech happen? A representative from a national group of school leaders warned against giving students the freedom to send disruptive messages, even if they are away from school. President Joe Biden's administration has expressed support for the school's side of the case. The ACLU and other organizations, however, say that if the school wins the case, it will make it harder for students to express themselves. The ACLU said that if Levy loses the case, it will make it easier for schools to follow and watch their students all the time. Sarah Rose is a lawyer with the ACLU and is working on the case. She said, Schools can do things to protect students that do not involve punishing kids for speech that they engage in off campus. I'm Dan Friedel. This is the Health and Lifestyle Report. If you are able to step outside and hear many types of birds, you might also have a greater feeling of well being. Two studies show that hearing diverse bird songs may help increase our happiness. One study was done by researchers at California Polytechnic State University, Cal Poly for short. A research team studied the effects of birdsong on people walking through a park in the U.S. state of Colorado. A biology graduate student, Danielle Ferraro, led the Cal Poly study. Ferraro says that there could be an evolutionary reason why we like birdsong. There could be sort of an evolutionary reason why we like birdsong so much. Um, and the idea is that uh, when we hear bird songs, it can signal safety to us. There could be many other reasons, too. Ferraro states that in some areas around the world, Bird song can also signal the arrival of spring and nice weather. Bird diversity, she adds, can also mean a healthy environment. She explained her study to VOA. Ferraro and her team played recorded songs from a diverse group of birds native to the area. They did this on hiking trails in a park in Boulder, Colorado. Over several weeks, the researchers played recorded bird song at certain times of the day, and other times they did not. Then they talked with hikers after they passed by. 
hikers who heard the recorded diverse bird songs reported a greater sense of well-being than those who heard simply the natural birds. The researchers suggest that both the bird sounds and biodiversity can increase feelings of well-being. Ferraro explained that she used native bird song for the study. This way, it would sound as natural as possible. They also did the study during the summer. She explains why this is important. So、um, the study took place in the summer, and that's kind of important because the spring is the most birds' breeding season. And if we had played the song during their breeding season, you know that might have disturbed them. We didn't want to disturb the birds too much. The study was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B in December 2020. The Science Daily recently reported that scientists in Germany examined for the first time whether a diverse nature also increases human well-being across Europe. The researchers looked at the 2012 European Quality of Life Survey to study the connection between the different kinds of birds in their surroundings and. Life satisfaction. They looked at more than twenty-six thousand adults from twenty-six European countries. Europeans are particularly satisfied with their lives if their surroundings have a high species diversity. Explains the study's lead author, Joel Melthorst. He is a researcher. At the Schengenberg Biodiversity and Climate Research Center, the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research, also known as IDIV, and the Goethe University in Frankfurt, he and his team found that the happiest Europeans are those who can experience many different kinds of birds in their daily life, or who live. In near natural surroundings that are home to many species, they reported their findings in the December 2020 issue of Ecological Economics. So, if birdsong is good for our mental health, how can we increase the different types of birdsong we hear? Um, I would recommend planting native trees and flowers. Um, because we have a lot of、um, you know pretty ornamental plants in our cities, and they might look nice to us, but birds can't necessarily use them. So I think it's important to have、uh, species that are native to the area to、uh, increase bird diversity. And that's the health and lifestyle report. I'm Ana Mateo. Protect yourself against the new coronavirus. Wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites: 
the World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Today, on our National Parks journey, we visit a land of giants, high up in California's Sierra Nevada mountains. Here, you will find the largest living things on Earth, as well as the tallest mountain in the continental United States. You will also find the deepest canyon in America. Welcome to Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. The park gets its name from the area's ancient sequoia trees. They are among the oldest trees on the planet. Millions of years ago, different kinds of sequoias grew in many different places. Only two kinds exist today, the redwood and the giant sequoia. Both are found in California. Redwoods are taller, but the trunks of giant sequoias are much bigger. Sequoia National Park's forests are thick with giant sequoias. Many of the trees are several thousand years old. The largest is called General Sherman. It is named after a U.S. general in the Civil War, William Tecumseh Sherman. The tree is 31 meters around. It stands almost 84 meters tall, and it continues to grow. It sits within the park's giant forest. The forest is home to over 8,000 sequoia trees. General Sherman is more than 2,200 years old. It is the world's largest tree in terms of the amount of wood it contains. The National Park Service says if the tree were cut down, it would provide a huge amount of wood construction planks. It says if they were laid end to end, they would stretch for almost 200 kilometers. In the late 1800s, people grew concerned about logging activity in the area. They sought to protect the giant sequoias from being cut down for wood. One of those people was Walter Fry. In 1888, he came to the Sierra Nevada mountains as a logger himself. He spent five days with a team of loggers trying to take down a single giant sequoia tree. Fry then decided to count the tree's rings to learn its age. The answer shocked and saddened him. The tree they had cut down was more than 3,200 years old. He and his team of loggers had ended thousands of years of growth. The experience led Fry to change jobs. He became a naturalist. He studied the trees and measured the size of fallen sequoias. He also joined the fight to protect them from future loggers. When a petition was created to urge Congress to create a national park in the area, 
Fry was the third person to sign it. Sequoia National Park was established on September 25, 1890. It became the country's second national park after Yellowstone. In 1940, Congress established another park near Sequoia, Kings Canyon. It and Sequoia National Park have been managed together since 1943. Kings Canyon is home to the deepest canyon in the United States, as well as a famous Sequoia forest called Grant Grove. Here you will find the world's second biggest tree, the General Grant Tree. It is over 3,000 years old. Along with the world's biggest trees, the area is also home to one of America's highest peaks, Mount Whitney. It measures 4,414 meters. It lies in the eastern part of Sequoia National Park. While many visitors travel here to witness the giant sequoias, some visitors also come here to climb Mount Whitney. The climbing trail itself begins at an elevation of over 2,400 meters, already very high for some people. Many hikers experience altitude sickness while trying to reach the top. More than 30,000 people try to climb Mount Whitney each year. Only about 10,000 reach the top. Of course, the park offers less extreme hikes as well. One of the most popular is the Moro Rock Trail. Moro Rock itself rises more than 2,000 meters. But hikers only need to climb the final 90 meters to reach the top. From there, they are rewarded with stunning views. The towering Sierra Nevada mountains and kilometers of giant sequoia forests. Climbers also get a view of the 90-kilometer-long Kawea River, which runs through a deep canyon. Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park is home to a richly diverse animal world. More than 300 species of wildlife live in the park. Mammals include the tiny white-footed mouse, the gray fox, and the bobcat. Black bears are also common. Bird species include the California quail, the northern owl, and the acorn woodpecker. There are also many animals that swim, slither, hop, or crawl. Visitors might see a northern Pacific tree frog, a western pond turtle, or the colorful rainbow trout. If you are lucky, you will not run into one of the park's poisonous wild rattlesnakes. But do not let bears and snakes scare you away. Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park is too extraordinary to miss. The words of the late naturalist John Muir perfectly describe a visit to this great park. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. 
And I'm Ashley Thompson. 